Welcome back, science friends. Today I'd like to talk to you about the infamous Demon Core, unfortunately claimed the lives of two scientists in the 1940s, and along the way we're going to learn about nuclear fission and how chain reactions in nuclear physics works. In the mid-20th century, the Manhattan Project was in full swing as scientists raced to harness the power of the atom to create the world's first nuclear weapons. One of the key components of these weapons was the plutonium core, a sphere of highly enriched plutonium that would serve as the heart of the bomb. One such core, known as the Demon Core, would go on to play a significant role in the development of these weapons, as well as the tragic accidents that claimed the lives of two scientists. Now, before we dive into the story of the Demon Core, let's take a moment to understand why these cores are so important and what their role is in the chain reaction of a nuclear reaction. These plutonium cores are at the center of nuclear weapons and their design is critical to the success of the bomb. Also, understanding these basic ideas will teach us how nuclear reactors work to produce nuclear energy. Now, the core is made of highly enriched form of plutonium, an unstable element that undergoes nuclear fission when it reaches critical mass. When a core is compressed by a carefully timed explosion, it reaches this critical mass and releases a massive amount of energy, the power of the atomic bomb. Now, just for a second, I want you to picture a nucleus of an atom. You know that there are protons, which are positively charged. And you also know that there are neutrons in the nucleus, which have no charge. Now, think about it. The positive protons want to repel each other. So if the nucleus wants to repel, then why does the nucleus stay together at all? Why doesn't it just explode if everything wants to push apart from electric repulsion? Well, that's because there's an even stronger force in the nucleus of every atom, and it's called, cleverly, the strong nuclear force. It's much, much stronger than the electric repulsion, so it can hold the nucleus together, but it only acts over extremely small distances only inside the nucleus. And the strong nuclear force emanates from, or is generated from, the quarks which are in the protons and also in the neutrons. So one way to make a nucleus more stable as you add protons to it is to also add more neutrons to the nucleus because neutrons don't have any electric repulsion, but they do make the strong nuclear force. So we you just pile in extra neutrons in the nucleus and the nucleus becomes more stable. But there's a problem. If you add too many neutrons to the nucleus, thinning out the number of protons that are there, it does give more strong nuclear force, but because it's over such a small distance, the nucleus gets to become unstable as we add more neutrons and make the nucleus larger. So when you get to these really large radioactive elements like plutonium, the reason that these large nuclei such as uranium and plutonium are unstable is because they have so many protons and so many neutrons in the center that the strong nuclear force even as strong as it is, is having a hard time containing and holding it together. And if you keep adding neutrons to the nucleus, then what's happening is you're making the nucleus physically larger and that strong nuclear force can't contain it, and so occasionally a neutron escapes from the nucleus, and we call that radiation. Now these neutrons that escape, that is what is involved in the chain reaction of atomic bombs and also in the chain reaction of a nuclear reactor. So when you study atomic physics, you'll find out that every element on the periodic table has neutrons and protons. And if you have too few neutrons, the nucleus becomes unstable. But if you have too many neutrons, the nucleus also becomes unstable. So when you hear terms like the isotope of plutonium or the isotope of uranium, that's because these different elements have different number of neutrons and they all have different stabilities. So let's start with the basics. An atomic bomb is a weapon that derives its destructive power from the rapid release of energy during a nuclear reaction. There are two types of atomic bombs. One is a fission bomb, where the nucleus splits apart because it's decaying. That's what we're talking about today. And the other type of reaction is called fusion, which is what happens in the sun, and it's a much cleaner form of power. We're also trying to work on developing fusion reactors, but so far the research is not quite there yet on fusion. Now in nuclear fission, which is what we're talking about today, the process of splitting a large atomic nucleus releases an incredible amount of energy in the process. This process is initiated when a neutron strikes the nucleus of a fissile material, such as uranium-235 or plutonium-239. And that's what I'm talking about. The numbers after the element refer to kind of the weight of the element there. It's called the isotope. And so the more neutrons you have, the more unstable or the more radioactive it is. And when you have a neutron, slam into one of these unstable 
isotopes, it can trigger another neutron to be released. But then that neutron can go on and slam into other isotopes nearby and cause more neutrons to be released. So it's literally a chain reaction of almost like dominoes falling, one neutron triggering thousands and millions and trillions of additional neutrons to be released, and then the nuclei of all these isotopes decays, and that's what an atomic explosion is. Now, on a side note, a peaceful nuclear reactor to generate electricity, a similar thing is happening, but we don't, in that case, want a runaway reaction like a bomb. We want a controlled release of energy to generate electricity. So when a nucleus absorbs a neutron, it becomes unstable and it splits into two smaller nuclei, releasing more neutrons and more energy to propagate the chain reaction. Now let's talk about this chain reaction itself. A chain reaction occurs when the neutrons released from one fission event go on to cause further fission events, creating a self-sustaining chain reaction. For a chain reaction to be sustained, the neutrons must be slowed down to increase the probability of triggering further neutrons to be released. So you literally want neutrons being released, triggering more and more and more neutrons to be released in the radioactive material. Now we have to talk about something called supercriticality. Supercriticality is the state where the rate of the reaction increases over time. Think about it this way. If one neutron comes out and is only able to trigger one additional neutron on one additional isotope, then we say we're right at the critical state. One neutron triggers one additional neutron to come out. Right, that's like the break-even point. But if that one neutron could then trigger two additional neutrons to be released from a neighboring event, then that's what we call supercritical. And supercriticality is the state when the runaway chain reaction happens, where one neutron can trigger more than one neutron to be released in a chain reaction. So in a nuclear bomb, the material has to be brought into a supercritical state to achieve an explosion. Now this is typically done by using a neutron source to initiate the chain reaction and a carefully designed explosive assembly to compress the material, making its density higher and causing the chain reaction to happen. Basically what's going on is you have the plutonium core in a non-supercritical state, right? But when you want to detonate the bomb, what you do is you put conventional explosives surrounding the sphere and they detonate, they compress the nuclear material, putting all the atoms momentarily closer together. When you bring all of them closer together, then these neutrons can begin triggering their neighbors to trigger further neutrons to be released and the chain reaction happens. So nuclear weapons are detonated by typically conventional weapons which compress the core and put it in that supercritical state. And then once it gets into that supercritical state, the chain reaction takes over and the entire nuclear reaction happens. The demon core was a 6.2 kilogram sphere of plutonium that was used in two separate criticality accidents in 1945 and 1946 at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. The core was intended to use in a third nuclear bomb, but due to the end of World War II, it was never used, so they decided to do experiments on it to learn more about the chain reactions. Now, the first accident occurred on August 21st, 1945, when physicist Harry Daglihan was conducting an experiment to determine the critical mass of the core. But during the test, he accidentally dropped a tungsten brick onto the demon core, and that caused it to go supercritical and emit a burst of neutron radiation. Now, we don't typically see neutrons, right? But in a radioactive event like that, when a burst of neutrons is released, it's like trillions of microscopic bullets literally flying through your body. And they're not going to be stopped by skin and they're not going to be stopped by bone. Radiation like that in the form of neutrons literally tears microscopic holes in your body and disrupts the DNA going on as well. And so that is what's actually making you sick and that's why people die from radiation sickness. Now, Daglihan quickly moved the brick off of the core, but he had already received a fatal dose of radiation. He died 25 days later from acute radiation poisoning. Now, the second accident happened on May 21st, 1946, when physicist Louis Slotlin was performing a similar experiment. In this case, he had a screwdriver in his hand, and the screwdriver slipped, which caused the core to go critical and released another burst of neutron radiation. So he quickly twisted his wrist, flipping the top reflector to the floor, and tried to shield other people who were in the room from as much of the radiation as he could. However, he received a lethal dose of radiation and died nine days later again from acute radiation poisoning. 
Now, these two accidents, while they were tragic, they provide valuable insights into the danger of working with nuclear fissile materials and the importance of safety protocols. Things like what were happening in the 1940s would never be allowed today. You would never be allowed to have a subcritical core that was able to go critical uh, right on the desktop with a brick or a screwdriver. That just would not happen today. It's too dangerous. Now, after these incidents, the core, which was originally referred to as Rufus, was then kind of colloquially renamed to the Demon Core because it had caused so many problems. Hands-on criticality experiments were stopped, and remote-controlled machines and TV cameras were designed and implemented to perform the experiments from a safe distance. Now, the Demon Core was intended for use in the Operation Crossroads nuclear test, but after these criticality accidents, time was needed for its radioactivity to decrease and for it to be re-evaluated for the effects of the fission products it held. Now, eventually, the core was actually melted down in the summer of 1946, and the material was recycled for other cores and other experiments. The story of the Demon Core serves as a powerful reminder of the incredible power of the atom and the importance of safety in scientific research. It's a tale of scientific curiosity and tragedy and the lessons we can learn from the past as we continue to explore the wonders of our universe. It really is a tragic tale and it speaks volumes to the differences to the way research was conducted 50, 60 years ago compared to today. I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Please drop me a line, let me know what you think. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.